All right. So, uh, I've said it's a lot this year. There's a lot of first time watches, but this is a first time watch for me. <clears throat> and I've never understood the title, Silence of the Lambs, still watching this. But what this mop has to do is I've always seen this. <clears throat> so the title, Silence of the Lambs, comes from the strange noises that Curry Starling heard when she was a kid. And that she wanted the, the, the sounds to stop. It's an ongoing thing with her and Lecter. He was asking her, you know, did the lamb stop screaming? And this moth uh, represents the death moth or whatever. The, the death head moth, I think it's called. That Buffalo Bill puts down his victim's throat. Although the... You see, look at that. That's actually a painting by Salvador Dali. Put, you know, it's with naked women. In the form of a skull, which is kind of cool. Uh, Lord Dali. Salvador Dali. <clears throat> yeah, so this is the first time watch for me. It was very interesting. This movie was a little bit shorter than Manhunter by about, I don't know, five minutes. <clears throat> Not that much shorter, actually. Like 118 minutes, I think. And this, unsurprisingly, of course, uh, this, of course, won an Academy Award, Best Picture, in 1991, or 92, whichever, it's come out in 91, I don't know how early it came out in 91, so it could be one in 92, I don't know, but, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, in the film, of course, you know, Follows Clarice Starling as she is trying to track down a serial killer by the name of Buffalo Bill. Clarice Starling, of course, is played by Jodie Foster. Trying to track down Buffalo Bill, portrayed by Ted Levine. And she has to ask the, you know, Dr. Hannibal Lecter, played brilliantly by Anthony Hopkins for clues, basically. <clears throat> There's other characters like Chilton, Dr. Chilton, who in this version is played by Anthony Held. Unlike in the original, he's played by a different actor. I don't know, you know, Manhunter, he's played by a different actor. There's actually two characters that carry over from Manhunter, although they're played by different actors, and this is a different continuity. You have Chilton, played by Anthony Held here, and um, Jack Crawford, who in Manhunter was played by Dennis Farina. Here is played by John Glenn. Or Scott Glenn. Scott Glenn? John Glenn. Scott. Hold on. Scott. Scott Glenn. It's right there on the top. How do you forget? It's your own name. <clears throat> Scott Glenn. Who was in background? It was the villain in that. So, yeah. They're tracking down, like I said, the Buffalo Bill. And, uh, there's a lot of mind game stuff in this movie. There's like many mind games. Like, at one point, Han Lecter gives out a name that's like an anagram for something, and Clarice is able to figure it out, but no one else is. It just serves to make children look like a fool. Oh, I know who the killer's real name is. It's uh, John Friend or something like that. But it's not. It's <clears throat> it's an anagram or something else. And I like how Hannibal Lecter plays his games. And we get to see Hannibal Lecter more in this than in Manhunter. Uh, in... I'm not saying that, that Brian Cox was bad. He wasn't. We didn't get to see him as much as we get to see Anthony Hopkins in this movie. And I, it's almost a shame that they didn't, you know, continue the continuity of Manhunter with this. Where they have, have Brian Cox come back to play the role. <clears throat> continue that continuity. Even if they did recast... Uh, Chilton, because I, I believe they do end up recasting uh, Crawford, 
or the prequel. I believe he's played by, uh, what was it? Red Dragon. Harvey Keitel in that one. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Anthony Hopkins' performance of this is fast tap. And I mean, look at me that. Fantastic. This movie's dirty, though. Man, like, you got Buffalo Bill. The famous scene. There are some things that I know that, that just are common knowledge. Like, the famous Goodbye Horses scene, which was, of course, parodied in Clerks 2. You know what I mean? I want to show you something. Oh, my God, is that it? No, not that. <clears throat> but, uh, and then, you know, I ate his liver with some fava beans in a nice candy. <clears throat> Hello, Clarice. That sort of thing. Those kind of lines of delivery. But also, the Nickelodeon TV show Sam and Cat, which was a spinoff of iCarly and Victorious, parodied this. Parodied this. Even bringing back Anthony Held to play the doctor in that, in that parody, where they go to see Neville Papperman, who's an iCar iCarly quote-unquote villain, and then he's playing the Hannibal Lecter role, down to being in the blue jumpsuit and he basically telling them how to take care of Nora and Nora is basically she's a psycho that was in two iCarly specials and then here she wants revenge on Carly, Fred and Sam Carly, Freddy and Sam but uh, she can't get to Freddy Carly is all the way in Italy so she's got to get to Sam right and so they go to Neville for help, and he's basically Hannibal Lecter. And then this ends up, of course, uh, she ends up kidnapping. She kidnaps Dice, which is her little curly-haired friend, and puts him down in the the well, like uh, Buffalo Bill does with Catherine. And they sort of reenact the scene, but like in th in that version. Like, she has, it's a chicken. She has the chicken instead of the dog. I'll get the chicken. I'm going to fry it up. You know, and that sort of thing. And then at the end, Neville Pepperin's escaped. Although, in that version, it's in the same institute. Whereas, in this version, there's a big old thing where he escapes and hides and stuff. And then you get the thing where he's like, he calls her. He goes, I have to go. I'm having a friend for dinner, which is another famous line from this movie. But in that show, it's actually Gibby. I don't think he's going to eat Gibby. Although we never do see Gibby again. He's not in a new white collar. So did Neville eat him? Is that why he gained weight? I don't know. I don't know. Did Neville eat Gibby? Anyway, back to this. Yeah, there's another line from the movie. I'm having a friend for dinner. An old friend for dinner. That line. Now, his escape, I figured it out. Having not seen this before, I figured it out. Because you got Charles Napier's character in this, right? And he's one of the guards. And when he go when um, when Lecter attacks them, he attacks Napier and the other guard and stuff. And they find Napier's character unconscious but still alive. And they they strap him up on a gurney and they're trying to find Lecter, that he's somewhere, like he disappeared somewhere in a facility, and they see there's like something laying on top of the elevator. And when they go to investigate it, they think he's just laying there, like, because they, they see he's been shot. They know he's been shot, so maybe he's like weak or whatever. But it turns out this is actually Napier, Charles Napier, with his face ripped off, and Hannibal put it on his. And I'm like, somehow, I, before this even happened, I'm like, somehow I think that's Lecter. And they're, and it's not really him. What he did with the body, I don't know. But how he was able to do all that, he does call the elevator. I didn't think of that. He calls the elevator and puts it down first. Makes it go down first. Was someone on the fifth floor? So he just puts the thing on there, and then they don't. Okay, I get it. I get it. 
Very smart. So yeah, he ends up escaping. Because there's a whole thing with him and Chilton where he's like, where like Clarice comes in and lies to like, they're like, hey, you help me with this and I'll, uh, I'll get you clearance. But she lies because she just wants some information. They have this thing where he's telling her stuff if she, if, if she, if she tells him stuff about her childhood and that's what he learned about her father dying and the screaming lambs and stuff like that. Even orders a lamb chop after that. <clears throat> uh, but uh, he makes a deal with Chilton. Chilton will transfer him if he tells him the name. If he tells him the fake name, John Friend or whatever it was. And then he goes to the news. He's like, uh, the name. I know the name. And I will you know, deal with it, whatever. And it ends up being fake. So, you know. Uh, but yeah, I like this movie. It, it's a little long in the tooth. Much like Manhunter, but it works. The only thing that I... Really criticize you got there's two things. One's a nitpick, one is that an actual criticism. The first nitpick, Clarice's accent. Okay, I understand she's supposed to be from a certain part of the United States. And I got used to it as it went on, but it was a little bit jarring. Another parody. Uh In Living Color has a character named Oswald who is a parody of Hannibal Lecter. In one such parody skit. Barbara Bush goes to visit, then First Lady of the United States, goes to visit Oswald. And it's Kelly Caulfield doing the impersonation as Clarice Starling with the whole accent. And I thought that was over the top for that, but she actually does it here. This is interesting. And I can't tell you if Julianne Moore does a better version than the next one. I know she could do a Southern accent. I've heard it before, but it comes up a little weird at first. It does get better, but it comes off a little weird at first. But I get used to it. She's really good. Hopkins is really good without, you know, not even need to say that. Of course he's really good. Even Ted Levine is really good as Buffalo Bill, albeit a very weird performance, but still a good performance. Scott Glenn, he's fine. Doesn't get much to do in this movie. Anthony Held, pretty good as Chilton. I like the, the score. I don't remember who did the score. But I do like the score in it. Who did the score? Howard Shore. Not bad. Not bad. So my my big criticism of this comes from the climax. So Clarice is investigating the disappearance of Catherine. Anyone? You know, and she's investigating a recent death. Uh, trying to figure out anyone who's connected. The first, uh, Federica, I think her name is. Frederica, the first disappearance. And so she finds a connection trying to figure out, you know, what is, you know. And she ends up at this house. She's already told by this point by Crawford that they found him. And they're en route, en route, en route, whatever. To his place where he lives, right? In Calumet City, Illinois, just outside Chicago. Home of the Blues Brothers, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> oh, do we? From Calumet City, Illinois. But, uh, <clears throat> so they're going to en route to doing it. And then they do this double take where you see Buffalo Bill, you know he's been doing, you know, dog. Oh, another famous line. It puts the lotion on its skin unless it wants the hose again. And again, that was parodied by the Clerks the Animated Series. It puts the lotion in its hand and puts it in the basket. Shut up. Is it safe? Is it safe? Yes, it's safe. It's real safe. Is it safe? It puts the lotion in on its skin and puts it in the basket. Shut up. It's safe. Is it safe? Ah! What's his problem? Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, so he's in there, he's, uh, he, this is shortly after the goodbye horses thing, he hears his dog, she's got the dog down there or whatever, and so he, then he, then the doorbell rings, and he goes up, maybe that's after he sees, no, because she comes in, he, the doorbell ring, right, and this is 
compounded with the FBI agents sneaking up and ringing the doorbell. So you think, okay, they're there, they're going to catch him. But surprise, they're at a house in Illinois where no one's at. It's empty because he's using a different alias. He's in another house in the same town where Clarice is. And in fact, Clarice is at that very house at that moment. Bullshit. That is the most coincidence of all coincidences to ever happen. That is, I don't know if that's in the book, but that is bullshit writing just so you can have her be the one that finds him, that has the final confrontation with him and takes him down. To tell us, hey, he's over here, only for her to accidentally bump into him. Her not knowing, and yet still somehow to be prepared to take him down. No, she has FBI training, but she sees him there, doesn't know who he is, he says he's someone else, and then because she sees the moth, she figures out it's him. For all intents and purposes, he should have already taken advantage of her, you know, not knowing. As soon as he saw she was FBI, he think, oh, she doesn't know who I am. So I got to nip this in the bud real quick. Instead, he's fumbling for a freaking number on a card, which for all it could be nothing. But I feel like Buffalo Bill would have been smarter here. He sees an FBI agent come in. He knows he's caught if she figured it out. And he keeps asking her questions. She's sitting there fumbling, asking her questions, trying to get information, wasting time when he should... Get the advantage and say, oh, yeah, it's in here. I'll get it. All I have to do is say, oh, the card, it's in here. I'll go get it. He goes, because we see he has a gun in there. He goes in there, grabs the gun, boom, one shot. She's not expecting it. So before she sees them off, before he starts asking questions, making himself a little more, you know, adding more fuel to the fire that he might be up to something. He says, oh, yeah, they're in it. The, I have the card in the back. I'll go get it. Just come on in. Goes back, grabs the gun, boom, shoots her. She's dead. But if he did that, there'd be no movie. Or he could fire a shot and she's able to use her train to roll out of the way or just take it in the shoulder and able to fire another shot off at him. It's one thing. But he should have had a tactical advantage over her instead of running to the back, grabbing his gun, and then running off down to the basement to hide with his night vision goggles which why and she ends up taking him down anyway it's pure coincidence is she just so happened to find the guy by accident i feel like she should have known more going into it she should have known for sure that that was where he was and not just looking for someone else and found him i always hate that movies and tv shows where it's like oh you accidentally ha happened to find the guy not meaning to but you found him it's a little stupid. You know, it's a coincidence that she found him. But it wouldn't happen like that. There's no way. Logic would dictate otherwise that she wouldn't find him that quickly. Especially if they think they found him. And she's just trying to find, you know, any clues they can find to solidify that this is the guy. And she just happens to find the guy even when he's not supposed to even be there. So... I don't know. It's a little too much for me, but yeah. So she takes him down, rescues the girl, and then she's, you know, got this fancy FBI dinner thing. They say, oh, you have a phone call. She picks it up. It's Hannibal Lecter. Uh, I won't pursue you, so I assume you won't either. Something like that. But we know that's not true because sequel. Uh, but, uh, and he's like, you have to excuse me. I'm having an old friend for dinner. And we see him stalking Chilton. Which is why he's not in the sequel. Because he's dead or eaten. By the way, another thing I want to I wanna talk about is like... Why... The way they describe how Hannibal Lecter takes care of his victims. Like he just starts eating them. Skin and all. I believe that goes in the handle, but it's just like, are human teeth really that strong? 
that if you really, really try, you can bite through human skin. I don't... Only thing I can think of is if you, like, soften it. I don't... Ow, I'm not going to try to bite through my own skin. Now, that hurt. I know you can make bite marks, but can you actually tear the skin with your teeth? I know, like, animal teeth can do that. Because they, they got sharper canines than humans. Like, dog's teeth, for instance. They are sharper than humans' teeth. That really hurt. I had dent on my own. I did that again. God damn. Maybe that's true. You know, I haven't bitten by a dog before. It's teared the skin. So I know. But human? It's possible. But to the way, the way I've seen clips and stuff where he just likes bite off someone's face. I don't know. It's always been weird to me. It's iffy. It's not negative or anything. It's just very weird. You can just do that. Because I never, you know, thought of that. But. Obviously, this movie is pretty, 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 pretty good. I know. Hey, Scotty, you should be to the moon. You should be to the moon. This is a first time watch, okay? There are some other first time watches that will get it to the moon, like the burning, you know. But this was, for what it is, pretty good. I'll say that. All right. It's not a masterpiece to me. It's a great movie. Don't get me wrong. But I just. It's not something I think I would ever go back to. It it's not one of those movies that you can. It's like a it's like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Other people would say, "Oh, that's a to the moon," but I would say, "Nah, that's maybe a pretty good." I don't know. I think I reviewed that before I started my rankings, my rating system. But it's still a good movie. So is this. It's just rewatch value for me. Rewatchability is something I strive for in movies. This is probably not going to be one I'll go back to. Same thing with Manhunter. But this is better than Manhunter, even though they're both pretty good. This one is better, so, it's, you know. Uh, but, uh, yeah. So, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the science of the land? Excuse me. Let me know in the comments below. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I'm Scotty, and I'll see you in the next one.